Hi, I'm Colin. And I'm Megan. And this is Pet Sitter Sitter Confessional. Confessional. An open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Today's episode is brought to you by Time to Pet and Pet Sitters International. One of the most common questions that we hear from pet sitters across the globe is, how do I set myself apart from others in my area? And today, Melanie Haynes, owner of Space Coast Pet Services, based out of Central Florida, comes on and shares some very specific and some very tangible advice that she has learned from being a pet professional for the past several years. Melanie's take on this is to be you and stay true to yourself, and I love how she presents that. Melanie is also a virtual assistant, and we spend some time talking about the benefits of a virtual assistant to a business and how to build a successful working relationship with a virtual assistant to make sure that you're getting the most that you can out of that. Let's get started. Hi, Colin. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. So um, my name is Melanie Haynes. I am a mother of two younger children, and I live in Vieira, Florida, which is on Florida's Space Coast on the east side. I own a pet sitting and dog walking company called Space Coast Pet Services, and I also and the owner of a virtual assistant company for pet business owners it's called Virtual Pet Petrepreneur. Yeah, and I love the name of your pet business because you're Space Coast Pet Services. And I love just the, the tie-in that you have to the, the local community there and, you know, the launching of the, the spaceships and all that kind of stuff. I just, I, I love how you were able to make that tie-in. Right. And when I was thinking of my company name, you know, I bounced around lots of things I couldn't think of it. And I thought... Let me just go with our location. It's pretty simple. It tells you exactly what we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's such a unique name. You immediately get exactly where you are and, and what you're, where you are in relation to other things, too. So what got you started in pet care? So I'll try to make a long story not so long. Um, I spent most of my post-college um, career in defense, in the defense security industry. So I did security program work for like our nation's largest defense contractors. And that's what brought me to Florida. I was working over where they do the shuttle and, um, well, no longer the shuttle, but like the satellite launches. And um, I actually had a back injury and that led me to getting laid off. And when I was laid off from my corporate job, I took some time to heal and recover and, you know, be a mom. But then I thought, well, you know, the mortgage isn't to pay itself. What can I do that I enjoy doing that can kind of put some food on the table while I figure out my next move? And I honestly thought I would continue with my corporate career. So I started offering like pet sitting and dog walking. Honestly, I thought it was going to be a hobby. I love animals. It's something I wanted to do. And the need was there. I mean, I was booked out from the minute I started. And then the longer I did it and I got more and more booked and the money started coming in. And I thought, you know what? I'd really like to make this an official business. So it took me about three months to you know, start my LLC and legitimize my my business like paperwork wise but that's how I got started I got started just thinking it was going to be a hobby and it turned out to be um, an interesting career change for me <laughs> well I think that follows the same path that that many of us get into it of oh this is something I enjoy doing I I'm relatively good at it let me just do this for the time being and then you look back five years down the road <laughs> go, oh, I, I'm running my business <laughs> yeah and one thing at least for me personally um, a lot of like my health and stress issues was just not being happy in my environment, in my job. And even though the pet sitting and dog walking was obviously a huge pay cut, I no longer had corporate benefits and insurance, but there's really no price tag you can put on being happy and not having that stress that my, my life really improved once I did what I loved, even if I wasn't making as much. So that was um, the most important thing that made me decide to stick with it and not go back. I just, I didn't want to go back to being unhappy. Yeah, who would? And especially with something, again, that you're so passionate about and that you can do uh, and and it fits your schedule, right? It it allows you to flex it a little bit and and do things when you can and uh, just just make it work for you. Yes. I mean, my number one goal is to always make sure, you know, I'm a single mom. So I wanted to make sure I was there for my kids. And, you know, having a pet business really allowed me to do that. So I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. Now I am curious. You have a, a your your background in security and and all that. How does that play into how you run your business? Well, you know, it's funny because a lot of people really worry about letting a stranger in their home. You know, clients they're they're hiring a, 
a pet sitter or a dog walker and they're thinking, well, these people have my keys, they have my alarm codes. And I think my background and being able to, you know, talk to people at our meet and greets and kind of tell them where I come from, that it really instills trust in them. Like they trust me. They know that I am going to do a security check of their home. I'm going to keep their keys safe. I am not going to, you know, when I have a team hire just anybody off the street without a background check. Not that a background check will solve hundred percent of your problems, but at least, you know, you do do due diligence. So I think that really helps that people know that, yeah, they can maybe hire somebody a little bit cheaper who might be younger, but having, you know, an adult professional with a security background really makes them be able to trust me. Yeah. And that trust is so huge. It's so central to the the service that we're providing here. When you are going into somebody else's home, that's because they trust you and being able to talk to them about maybe some insecurities that they have or concerns that they may have about that, about who's going to be there. Yeah, I can 100% see how they'd be, you'd be able to kind of talk that language of, you know, these are the precautions that we take. This is how we control it. And, and everything's going to be just fine. Right. And knowing that somebody, you know, who's had um, a security clearance with the, the U.S. government coming to their home, I think they feel a little <laughs> bit more refreshed. But I've gotten so much feedback from clients that they really appreciate that. You know, I do check the doors and windows and look for any signs of entry while they're gone. I do, you know, double check to make sure everything's locked up and secure. So I think the peace of mind you know, is a big part of pet care, not just loving animals. So I'm glad that I can bring both to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Providing peace of mind to those clients. Yeah. They want to know that their pets are cared for, but they also have these other concerns going in the back and being able to just, again, come alongside them and go, it's okay. This I'm a professional. I can take care of this. That's, that's so huge. Right. Yeah. And I even have the tagline on my website that says, um, you know, it's custom care for pets and peace of mind for pet parents. So that's really a philosophy that I run my business on. Yeah. So, so tell us about the kind of services that you offer. So I offer, I mean, nothing like super special and unique is I offer the dog walking and pet sitting that includes cats, exotics. Um, I do in-home pet sitting in my home too. Some people will call it boarding, but here, because I don't have kennels and cages, it's more of like an in-home family style, um, you know, pet sitting. Um, I have offered poop scooping. I've kind of gone away with that just because of this time after um, COVID-19 we're kind of seeing a a reduction in all sorts of services. So I've kind of narrowed down what I do and my service area to kind of make, keep it profitable while I also, you know, explore other areas of, um, I guess, earning revenue and income for my family. Right. Well, that is the continual balance of being able to provide new and interesting services while making sure that they're profitable and trying to plan all that out. So especially in this time where things are so uncertain and see where exactly things are going to land, like that does, that is quite the balance to be walking. And one area um, that's going to pick up for my business is also house sitting. So even if somebody doesn't have pets, because we have a lot of snowbirds here in Florida and a lot of retirees, because there's a lot of travel restrictions, a lot of people who would be here for the winter months coming um, aren't able to travel back. So they are hiring me because I am a trusted um, you know, community service provider to come in and check on their homes and do their, like do their mail and just make sure everything's on the up and up while they're gone. So that's another source of um, income for my pet sitting business that's been picking up and that I really enjoy doing. I mean, I love the animals, but I also love knowing that I can help serve my community in more than, you know, one way. Sure. Yeah. Making sure that the homes are safe and that they're being communicated with about any issues that they have going on. Uh, yeah. I- I did want to ask about the exotics because I know it's something that Megan and I, we, we don't have a lot of experience in that. So I'm curious, you know, what kind of animals that you've cared for and how you prep and whether that's different or not than the typical dog or cat sit. Um, I wouldn't say I prep any differently of them. You know, I may refresh just like with either Google searching or, you know, studying the notes in the client portal about each specific animal. Cause each one, just like a dog, you know, there's not one way to take care of a dog, but, um, I really enjoy it because I love dogs and cats and that is, you know, the majority the bread and butter of our business, but I love having the variety and just getting to, I've always looked, I had a pet snake growing up. I've had rabbits, I've had turtles, I've had frogs. So I really enjoy having the variety. Um, I do take care of a rabbit pretty regularly. He comes and stays at my home. Um, we've had chameleons, we've had snakes, we birds. I have an African gray that started off as a client. And now it's become a long-term foster situation. It's been over, let's see, it's been over a year, almost a year and a half at the time that this will air um, that we've had him. It's actually a she, but they didn't realize it. So we 
we just call him he because <laughs> he's been a he for 19 years. And um, so when the pet parents couldn't, when his parents couldn't take care of him anymore, he, they, they asked if I would, you know, keep him. So I have. Um, yeah, I just, I, there's a lot of fish tanks. Sometimes even in the homes with dogs and cats, they have, you know, other animals too. Hamsters, gerbils. I just, I just love learning about all new animals and taking care of them and just having the variety. It's fun to me. Yeah, I can see how that variety would just, you know, continuing to, to learn new things and be exposed to new experiences and, and keeps it pretty exciting for you, I bet. My most, like, odd experience, I would say, was about in the first year of my business, I had, um, there was somebody with a pot belly pig. And I'm thinking in my head, like, okay, it's a cute little, no, this thing, I mean, he was, he was adorable, but he was, you know, probably like 250 to 300 pounds. He was huge. And they told me that he was crate trained like a dog, that he had a playpen and they needed to keep him. So I thought, okay, I'll keep him at my house. Cause in my mind, I was thinking like this cute little pot belly pig. So at one point for a week, I had this ginormous pig in my home, but I was also boarding dogs. And one of my clients who since passed away, he was a long haired German shepherd. His name was Ace. And Ace and this pig, his name was Hamilton. <laughs> Ace and Hamilton were the best of friends. They both barked. They both ran up and down the fence. They would go in their crates together. They would take naps together. And it was the sweetest thing ever. So while I probably wouldn't do that again now, it was such a great experience. And it really taught me, you know, check, like, check first, double check before you take on things. But it was a great experience. And yeah, I don't know. I just thought I'd share that. <laughs> no, that is really cool. Because yeah, you think pig, you know, it's in your home. You don't think this 300 pound animal is going to be. Yes. Around. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have great pictures from it. So. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> in, in Hamilton, of course. Of course. What a great name yeah, for yes. pig. <laughs> I mean, I would have suggested like Kevin Bacon, but yeah, Hamilton was great. <laughs> Maybe next time. Maybe next time. That's what. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard about Time to Pet? Chris Ann from Raining Cats and Dogs has this to say. Becoming a Time to Pet client has been a game changer for us. We can give our pet services clients real time cloud based information they never imagined they'd be interested in. And most importantly, to me personally, I can better manage my company and look forward to more. And not a small thing, Time to Pet is responsive to my request for new features and modifications to existing ones. If you are looking for new pet sitting software for your business, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of Pet Sitter Confessional get 50% off their first three months when they sign up at timetopet.com slash confessional. You mentioned uh, team members a little bit uh, briefly. So tell us about your team. Oh, Colin, where do I start? So as many pet business owners know, um, having a team, you know, has lots of pluses and it's, it's an up and down thing. There's, it's just a roller coaster of emotions and headaches and rewards. And so um, about a year in, I started hiring. And I had team member team members up until March of 2020 this year. Um, when right before COVID-19 hit, actually, my my last employee quit. They had two jobs and they thought they'd be able to go back and forth, but then the other job decided to hire them full time. So it wasn't, you know, anything negative. But I was just about to start hiring again. And that's when COVID-19 hit. And I really think that was a blessing to me mm-hmm. because as stressful as that was, I didn't have to worry about a team and layoffs versus furlough and PPP for employees or unemployment. I really just had to, you know, take care of myself and my family. So, um, I have not rehired since then. I have decided to stay on as solo and just kind of do what I can. That means that I'm not always available and I might have to reduce my service area. Things haven't picked up to the point to make it profitable again for me to hire. So right now I am a team of one, but I have had, I've hired probably a little over 20 people in the three years that I've had my business. And I mean, I've, I've learned a lot. <laughs> Let's just say I've learned a lot about being an employer. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, sure. As you mentioned, like it, it is less stressful in the fact that you aren't the one having to go out and do most of the services. But the other side of that is you have to now almost provide for them. You have to make sure that they're cared for and that they're busy 
uh, and that they're doing all of the right things, all of those considerations have to be taken into pl- into account when you decide to go and and hire. Right. And sometimes you trade one stress for the other. You know, when you're a solo sitter and it's, let's say, Christmas week during non-COVID times and you're <laughs> running ragged, it's stressful to say, okay, I've got this many visits. You know, you're on a strict time schedule to get it all done. But it's also pretty stressful when you're relying on other people to get the job done in a way that represents your company well and knowing that they could just walk out the door tomorrow and say, you know what, I quit. And now you're scrambling too. So you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons and, you know, the, the pluses and the minuses and feel and just know that you're taking a risk either way. Right. And I feel a lot of us are, a lot of us who do this solo are kind of always on the bubble of trying to decide if we're going to hire or not, hire or not, hire or not. So maybe what advice would you give to somebody who's thinking about that, thinking about hiring, you know, uh, right now? I would say, I mean, you really need to be honest with yourself and ask, are you okay? if something were to happen to you and you have no one to run your business. And on the other hand, if you're hiring and you want to keep hiring, you have to ask yourself, am I really okay letting go of some of the control? Cause you have to, or else you're not going to have a great relationship with your team members, you know, and letting them do the job according to how you trained and trusting that it's going to get done. Right. And that, you know, they'll come to you with any problems, but really you're kind of like setting your baby free in the world. And it's, it's very, you know, it, it can bring a lot of anxiety. So I would really say that you just need to make sure that you're okay with letting go and that you're at a good, I guess, income flow to be able to support them and pay for them, you know, because you don't want to bring on people and not pay them, right? Like that's just not (laughs) an ethical thing to do. Right. And I would say that you need to make sure that you are organized. Like the the best thing you can do to serve your employees and make sure you have your processes taken care of, you have everything in place so that their experience goes smoothly. Because who wants to bring on somebody in, into you know the middle of chaos? I mean, there's one thing that you learn as you go, and every business, you know, you're kind of going to learn through that as you, you know, when you first start hiring. But you really need to at least have a foundation of you know your processes, you know your training, and you really want to you know get them started on the best foot. Yeah, yeah, you want to do right by them. Like they're they're again, we we need to be caring for and taking care of the people who we bring on under us, that they're being paid appropriately that they're being kept busy, that they know what they're going to do. They're trained properly. All of those things. You're right. Like who you wouldn't want to be hired into the middle of chaos and people running around crazy. So why do that to somebody else? Right. And I hear some people or I've heard, you know, just online or wherever they'll say, I can't wait to hire so I can just sit back and relax. It's not really like that. And I don't think that's responsible to do. I mean, as the owner of the company, I feel like you should be there for your team to be the, not the last resort, but you want your team members to solve problems on the go. Right. But in the event of something, the, like the buck stops with you, you have to be able to make decisions and handle emergencies. You can't just sit back and send a newly hired person out and then say, well, I'm just not responsible anymore. I just don't think that serves them well. And I think your team members appreciate when you, they know that you're always going to have their back and you're there as a resource if they need it. Mm. Yeah, I know that totally is. It's, it's, it's part being a leader, part being a mentor, and part being a resource to, to them, continuing to teach them, right. help improve their services. And then again, hold, holding yourself responsible when things go wrong or when something needs to be taken care of, knowing that you back them, right? That they're just not out there dangling on their own, that you're going to cut them off if something happens, that you know you've got their, right. you've got their back. <laughs> For sure. So, I mean, I can't say that I won't hire again down the road, but right now I'm I'm happy with where I'm at. I've come to a place of peace that, you know, it is what it is. And there's a time and a place for everything and things change. There's ebbs and flows. And I'm just kind of going with the flow right now. So I'm happy with it. Yeah. Enlighten us a little bit about what the market is like in your area. Oh, goodness. So, I mean, being where I am specifically in Florida, we have, you know, the younger, like family type age, you know, they have a family, they're, they're engineers, they work for this, like the government or the space program or something like that. But we also have a huge, huge um, number of retirees and people who are snowbirds. They live here half the time and they live somewhere up north half the time. So while there was, there was about a year and a half where I tried desperately to become solely a dog walking company because I thought, okay, weekly recurring revenue, that's the bread and butter. But honestly, this area isn't set up for that. So once I became realistic about who my market was and what's available, um, it just, it, I just naturally went to pet city. Hmm. So, I mean, I think there's, there's busier times, but people in Florida, I would say they travel all the time, even if it's just a weekend trip to Disney or, uh, you know, over to Tampa Bay to the other, the Gulf side of the beaches, 
or, you know, there's not really a, just a holiday travel season. So that's what I did like about, um, setting it up and having it as a pet, mostly pet sitting business, even though I do also dog walking, um, that there really wasn't a slow time. Now we're talking, you know, pre COVID, and not pandemic times, right? That's, <laughs> that's different in every way, shape or form, but just on the average, I would say, um, in my area, there's just, people are always traveling, either it's work travel or it's family travel, weekend travel. There's, there's pretty steady work if you're willing to put in the time and the effort and, you know, love on their pets. Yeah. Now, how do you find that you're able to differentiate yourself from others doing similar services? You know, I, it's funny because you asked that because there's so many times where people say like, what sets you apart? And they want like a word or something tangible. And I honestly think that the, the thing that set each one of us apart are the intangibles. Like mm-hmm. if someone can copy your website, they can copy every single service you have, but they'll never be, they'll never be you. They can't step into a meet and greet and be you. They can't, you know, no one can duplicate. Everyone's unique. And, and I, I just think that's wonderful because there's something for everyone. Mm-hmm. Like every client's not going to be a great fit for me and I'm not going to be a great fit for everybody, but that's okay because there's enough pets <laughs> and there's enough people to go around. So I can't really say it's, you know, one specific thing, but I really, I really think that the care and concern I put into not only just their pet, but their family, their home, just to making sure that their experience is comfortable and pleasant and pretty much stress-free. I just, I love being able to provide that service to the community. Yeah. Well, and you, you hit, you know, you said it's the intangibles that someone else will never be you. Like that takes a lot of confidence in yourself to be able to know that I am enough. I am enough right now to set myself apart from somebody else. I'm unique. I have my experiences. I'm able to do that. That can, Ooh, that's kind of that's kind of weighty at times. I feel like to be able to just to know that, like, yeah, I I do a good job. I'm confident in what I do, and that's enough. You know, as you said, like they can copy right. and paste your website exactly, but they'll never be you. Right, and I don't recommend clearly, you know, anyone copy anyone else. <laughs> yeah. But even if somebody was starting out, and you said, okay, I, I love what they're doing. They have a great, successful business. Nothing you do or see on paper that you copy is going to replicate that if you don't have it within you to bring yourself. I think like whatever you have in you in your personality and the way you communicate, that's what really sets every business apart. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love that. And, and think that that's, that's something that, you know, it may take some time to become comfortable with and to think through, but when you start looking at people around you to not immediately jump to what services are they offering? What training do they have? What are their prices right. to, to look at yourself and, and know that, uh, yeah, no, people choose me because I'm me. As you, you know, right. as, you said, as you said, it's never going. You're never going to be a hundred percent all the time. Fit good, best fit with a client, and that's okay. And that needs to be that right. way, so that you can work with the people that you want to be working with. Right. And don't get me wrong. This didn't happen. You know, this epiphany did not happen overnight. I've had my business for three and a half years, so it's just taken time and growth, and just being comfortable with who I am, knowing I'm doing the best I can, and that there's always room for improvement. And I mean, there's no one I'm competing with other than myself. What's it like operating in, in Florida with the hurricanes and everything that goes on with that? Oh my goodness, it can get kind of crazy. Um, I don't know if you knew, but 2020 has been the most active hurricane season that we've had since 1916. I heard on the news today, we have currently nine named storm that's named storms that have hit the um, continental, the lower continental um, United States. So it's we're in for a crazy ride, but everyone, when you live in Florida, you kind of know when you get here that June to November is hurricane season. You're going to get a lot of rain, a lot of tropical weather. And starting in September, you really start to buckle down and get ready. So not only do you prepare your home and having non-perishable food and lots of water and batteries and make sure your generator is working and, you know, gas cans full of gas if you need it, but I would say for the business wise, it's really about communication. So when a client comes on board, they immediately, they need to review and sign an agreement for an emergency weather hurricane policy I have. And that just sets the expectation of what I'm committed to doing in the event of severe weather and what they're going to be responsible for in the event as well. And I think having clear expectations kind of smooths it over as it goes, because the closer that the storm gets when we do, you know, have an impending um, hurricane, you know, tension rises, anxiety rises, people are stressed out. People want to know what's going to happen with my pet if I need to get out of here. So just knowing that 
I can keep communicating. And as the government issues, you know, whether it's a hurricane warning, hurricane watch, you know, severe thunderstorm warning, whatever it is, that we have policies in place. And I just communicate daily if I have to. The last one that we really were affected by, Irma, um, you know, there was sometimes every day, twice a day, I was sending out notifications, what I was able to do, what areas I was able to travel to. And just really as a community, we came together and they knew that they had somebody who could help care for pets, but they also need to, you know, have emergency contacts in place and local, a local plan in case I, I can't be there. Right. Yeah. And communicating all that up front. And I really like the, the staged approach that you have of linking it to these government releases of as the business owner going, well, I don't know when safe or what's not safe or what's going on. Link it to right. these announcements that come out and you, when <laughs> these things come out, you know, you do X, Y, Z and your clients know you do X, Y, Z and they need to do, do <laughs> X, Y, Z as well. Right. And making sure everybody's in that loop. Um, is that something that you remind clients of periodically or refresh or ask them about, um, you know, updating things uh, throughout the year? Oh, yes. I mean, in my client portal, I use Precise Pet Care. Um, everyone's required every two months to review their account and update it. As far as the severe weather policy, I will go in at the beginning of June each year and reset it so that the next time they log in, they have to re-review it and sign it just to make sure we're all still on the same page. And I know a lot of times I can sometimes get almost paralyzed where I don't know, should I say this? Should I say that? Should I offer this? Should I not? And being able to use, you know, the local um, emergency planners and the agencies to say, okay, I'm making a decision because the experts have made this and this, <laughs> they know what they're talking about. That kind of takes the pressure off of me. And now I'm just following my SOPs, right? Like if X happens, I say Y. If Y happens, then I send this email. So it really kind of takes the heat and pressure and I mean, I just think it's a smart way to do business because, I mean, things can get so crazy. And the, when we're hit by a storm, I mean, you don't know when you're going to have power. I mean, I remember to, um, a few years ago when Irma hit, we, I, lost, I only lost power actually for eight hours. I was surprised. A lot of my surrounding community lost it for about a week. I didn't have water for days. Whoa. Now, if you don't know what it's like to not have water, to like turn on the faucet, to brush your teeth, to pour water for dogs, to, I mean take a shower. That's stressful. So when you can kind of have a system and a process in place that kind of tells you what to do and kind of limit the decisions you have to make when you're in that high stress moment, it makes things so much easier. Oh, no, that's huge. You know, limit the decisions you have to make because they're pre-planned out. They're linked to other things that are external from your brain, which may be sleep deprived, super stressed because you're worried about taking care of your kids and the pets and the people in the area and everything going on. At that point, externalize that and you're just working the system too, right? You're just with it with everybody else. Right. And, and th that takes planning and maybe takes some, some practice and some discipline too to stick to that. But it pays off in the end. And I've actually found that that kind of strategy, for me at least, has been very beneficial in more areas than just, you know, my hurricane planning. I mean, everything in my business that I've created SOPs and processes for and canned emails. All of these things just make thing, life so much easier because you don't have to make the decision. You have a plan. I think the hardest thing is just making sure you stick with it, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, while you're making it, it's a lot of work to do it. But then if once you just implement it, it just takes a lot of... I have decision fatigue. I mean, between mm -hmm. being a mom, being a business owner, and just life in general, there's just so many decisions we have to make. And I really try to limit that and try to work on my... I've been really working on that the past year and a half or so is trying to get away from my decision fatigue. Yeah, no, I, I love that because yeah, if you don't like simple things, like you said, like pre-scripted automated emails that go out, like if you have to sit down and handcraft a bespoke email for every new client, you're going to look at that and be like, Oh God, what did I say last time? I'm so angry right now. Cause that other client, like, and you, you just, mm -hmm. just fire, it goes off automatically or you just copy and paste the pre the text that you use all the time and off it goes. And as you said, you don't have to worry about this decision fatigue. So that's really cool to hear that how it's you've implemented that not just in emergency planning, but in business planning too. Right. And it really helps, honestly, for people who are growing and scaling their business. If they're looking to hire like an office manager or someone to help them on their team on the back end, having those things already in place are going to like seriously make your life so much easier because who wants to hand off something and not have a guide? If you already have it in place because you're doing it, 
it's easier to hand that off, even if it's not long term. Like if let's say you got let's not say anyone's going to get hit by a car. Let's just say you had, you know, an unfortunate accident and you had to take, you know, two weeks off for health reasons or whatever, you know, being able to have somebody even short-term just be able to come in and pick up because you have everything written down and they can send your canned emails and they can follow your processes. That's just going to, to me, that's just um, great planning and just um, a great contingency, a contingency plan for any business to have. Making sure people can step in and it helps with training too. As you mentioned, if you want to bring somebody right. on. If you've got it lined out and it's what you fault you do, then you have confidence that when you hand it to somebody else, well, just, just do this and you'll you'll know it's going to get done. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. That's the goal, at least. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, thinking back over the last three years that you've been running your business and everything that you've you've experienced and how you've grown and uh, things like that, what would be the biggest thing that you say you've learned since starting? Gosh, there's so many things, Colin. Um, as I come up on my fourth anniversary, which will be in March of 2021, I would say that I've just learned so much about myself. I've learned about what boundaries I've had to make in order to be you know, happy and successful, whether it's client boundaries, employee, team member boundaries, just life boundaries. I've learned um, like how to work with so many different types of people because I love, I love meeting and working with different types of people. So um, but it's also a learning curve. Like when you're, especially if you're somebody who's like the boss or in charge, you know, to kind of go that fine line between it's different making a friend and, you know, also, you know, having to have rules in place and discipline policy, those kind of things. Um, I've really learned that you can, you can honestly, any business that you have, you're going to make the best or the worst of it. And it really just starts with your mindset. I mean, it's not one specific formula or recipe that says, okay, if you do X, Y, Z, you're going to have X amount of revenue, right? It's really about finding out who you are, what personality traits or what values mean the most to you and showing up that way in your business every day. If you're somebody who expects honesty and really values that, then make sure you're running your business that way. If you're somebody who values being on time then show up in your business that way. You know, those, just those kind of things about the inner work and just the mindset. I think I've learned more about myself and it's not necessarily business related. It's like personal growth related. No, that's huge because, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, whenever you're hiring people, the buck stops with you. And so growing into that level of personal responsibility and saying, yeah, while I'm running my business, I need to run my business the way I want to run it. And that fits with me and fits with how I value myself, my, my values, my goals, and, and aligning everything with that uh, so that you can, you know, you run the business that you, you want to be running. <laughs> but also being open to feedback. You know, there's a lot of times, where, um, a lot of times for us in the pet care industry, we get so high strung and so defensive when either our client's upset about something or one of our team members is upset about something. But I, I choose to look at it as this is an opportunity for free <laughs> advice on how to improve my business. <laughs> There's something that was done, whether they're right, it's not about who's right or who's wrong or placing blame, but it's an opportunity to learn, okay, this client didn't like that we did this. How can we improve for next time? And honestly, I appreciate those things because without it, how else are you going to find out how you should improve or how you can improve your client experience or your employee experience? All of these things, instead of looking at it as a negative, I look at it as a positive. Yes, in the moment, it doesn't feel great. You know, I have to make an apology or take responsibility for something that one of my team members didn't do right. But in the end, I think how we deal with it, whether it's a negative review online or a phone call from an angry client, that's really going to set the tone for how your company is viewed in your community. And it really, it's really going to set the tone on how you choose to grow as a person, whether you're going to take it as a negative and just get defensive and forget about it. Or if you're going to choose to make it a learning experience and really grow. Taking that time to, to look and grow from it instead of stopping and locking into your previous ways of behaving and acting and go, what is this teaching me? What is my business teaching me? What is this response teaching me? And going from there. The universe has a funny way of doing that, right? It usually yeah. shows up in ways that's going to help us grow the most. I yeah. see that in my children as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Children have a wonderful way of teaching you all of that stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. It shows you every, every inch of space that you need to grow as yes. a person. <laughs> <laughs> 
awesome. Uh, a few times now you've mentioned um, being a part of the community, being viewed as a responsible actor in the community and being viewed well in the community. Why, why is that important to you? And where does that where does that come from? I don't know. You know what? I grew up, um, my dad was in the Air Force. So I was a military brat. I lived in four countries and visited, I think it was around 27 by the time I was um, finished high school. So I think because I moved around so much and I got to know so many people in so many different places, but I never really had a hometown. If you ask me where I'm from, I'm going to say, oh, I'm, I'm a military brat. I'm not from anywhere. So when I moved to Florida, it's been seven and a half, almost eight years now. Um, I really feel like I wanted to plant roots. I wanted to get to know the community and really, I really want to leave any place better than I found it. If I can, you know, I can't save the world, but I can look around me and see how can I impact this better, whether or not I'm staying here eight years or if I'm staying here, you know, back in the day, only one to three years. So I think for me, I've always just grown up with a sense of pride about if you're going to be here, make the best of it. I mean, I, I hate heat and humidity, which is funny because I live in Florida. <laughs> However, how can I make the best of where I'm at? How can I go out in the world and when people encounter me or interact with me, they leave have feeling positive or at least not negative about the experience, right? I don't know. It's just, it's just part of how I grew up. And I just think uh, it's just a value that really means a lot to me. Yeah, There's so I mean, much negativity you know, in the world. I don't want to be a part of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and it, it speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, the businesses that we run are so much more than quote unquote, just a business, right? Like, yes. you know, and, and I know, I know you, you're putting yourself out there and trusting that you and being confident in you, because, you know, we talked about that of what sets you apart in your area. Well, it's you and how you interact with people. And knowing that when you are out there walking dogs or pet sitting, you're, you're visible. People know they see you. And they're going to look to you and see how you're reacting. Are you respecting the area? Are you kind to people? All those kind of things. We're not just running a business because we we do, we are part of a community. We are part of something bigger than just taking care of animals. Right. When you go into someone's home and especially when they're not there, I mean, you become to me, like you become part of the family. I always Mm -hmm. say like, these are my Space Coast pet families. Like, welcome to the Space Coast pet family. Everyone gets a welcome when they sign up as a client. because you really become an extended family. They are trusting you with their homes and with their pets who are family members. And so for me personally, treating it any other way just doesn't feel right. And I just, I don't know, I just try to run my business. While there's always room for growth, I don't have anything, you know, perfect or down pat. I really think staying true to my core values is is just really important to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love, I love hearing that. That's so cool. And to know that you're viewing it not just as your business, but you viewing it as being part of of a community and and taking care of people too. I'm only as successful as they are as well. Yeah. We're all in this together, this life, this business, everything. We're all in it together. (laughs) Now you also run a virtual assistant business. Why? (laughs) Yes, I do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Amongst the, all the other things you have going on. Now, th- tell tell us about that and why you started that. Funny story. So I actually, when I started my pet business, I told you I was just looking for like a little extra grocery money on the side because in my mind, I wanted to be VA. I've always wanted to be VA. I really loved the administrative and the project management side of my corporate job. And I thought, well, let me just try to do it for myself. And I really did the pet sitting because I just needed, you know, to feed myself and my kids while I was going to start the VA business. But I just didn't realize how quickly the pet business would blow up. So I've spent three years working on growing that and organizing that and setting it up with systems and, you know, things in place to have a team again someday. And so I finally, this year again, when things slowed down a little bit with COVID and I wasn't, you know, I called it crisis, crisis schooling, not homeschooling, because we weren't really traditional homeschool. We were all crisis schooling. Um, when that slowed down a little bit, I was able to pick back up with my original passion, which is serving other business owners. I just, I love doing that. And so that's how that started. That was originally the, that was supposed to be the first business, but it just ended up being the, the second one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, many of us may have heard of a virtual assistant, but it's kind of this other thing of like, oh yeah, they, they have a virtual assistant or have you used one, but we might not know what it what a virtual assistant does. So what does a virtual assistant do, I guess? <laughs> so, I mean, every virtual assistant could, you know, could offer different services. For me personally, I provide virtual assistance 
to business pet to busy pet business owners in the areas of like logo design, social media management, blog management, and general administrative, which could be like a one-off project. And so what that means for me is that I come in and I help business owners with the back end projects or things that they need to get done, but I do it from my home. I am my own business. So it's not a 1099 contractor and it's not hiring, you know, it's not a W2 employee. Um, it's really just being able to know what I'm really good at and what I enjoy and what I want to offer to help other business owners, because let's face it, we can't be everything to everybody all the time. <laughs> and so everyone eventually needs help. And so that's what I do. But there are virtual assistants who are like virtual bookkeepers or, you know, they could be Pinterest managers or they could be, you know, YouTube managers. So really, if there's anything that's in your business that doesn't need to be physically done by you and in person can be done by a virtual assistant. Everyone kind of defines their own business, what works for them. And as the business owner, maybe taking some time to think about, hmm, do I need to be doing this? Is this something that I need to be actively doing right now? And then maybe, you know, if maybe that's a staff member that can do that, or maybe, you know, you don't have people that are around you that can do those kind of things, then looking for a virtual assistant that, that can help. And it's not just what do I need to, it's do you want to? Mm. Like, there's a lot of things that you can do, but what, what are you saying no to in order to say yes to the things you don't want to do in your business? Every yes comes with an equal no. And I always tell people, look at the no's in your life. What are you saying no to? Are you saying no to going on vacation? Are you saying no to spending time with your kids after school? Are you saying no to taking a weekend off and, you know, sitting in front of the TV and binging on Netflix? Whatever it is that you're saying no to, that means you're saying yes to something else and vice versa. So I think it's important for business owners to really take a a look at not only the things that they can't do, but just the things they don't want to do. Like there's nothing wrong. There's no guilt in saying I would rather hire this out and spend time doing the things I love with the people I love the most. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Thinking about virtual assistants, um, if somebody's looking for, for one, what would you say makes a great virtual assistant? Well, I think it's going to depend on what you're looking for. But I mean, number one is, do they have you know the skills required to do what you need them to do? Or at least the, the motivation to learn if you have time, you know, if you don't need something tomorrow, if they have time to learn it. Um, but for me, honestly, I say that the biggest thing is personality. If you don't mesh well with somebody and you can't communicate well, and like the point of having a virtual assistant to me is to take stress and, you know, pressure off of you and to make things easier. And if you can't get along with and communicate well with the person that you're hiring, I think that makes it very stressful. I mean, it may work for short term, like one off project that you don't have to, you know, deal with, but for the types of things that I do, I have an ongoing relationship with my um, business owners and my clients that. I really love to be able to, you know, email or send a a text real quick and, you know, they get me, I get them and everything gets done and everyone's happy. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Those again, saying those expectations upfront early and reminding of them often is so huge in that so that you're not thinking, Oh, here's a project. Um, you know, it, it needs to, I know it needs to get done tomorrow, but uh, I'll just see whenever they can get it done or, or thinking that you can drop something like that and someone's going to be able to turn around as fast as possible or things like that. So knowing, right. Hey, what's your, what's your schedule actually like? What kind of things can you take on right now? And then as a business owner, being able to adjust accordingly and just being able to communicate those expectations. Right. I would say before you hire, have a clear, like be clear on what you need when you need it by and what your budget is. Because if you're not honest with yourself about when something's due, you can't fault anyone for not getting it done in the time that you needed it if you haven't clearly stated when it needs to be done. Like you letting go of how it gets done is going to be important because remember these aren't like we're not employees. We are our own business owners and we're taking the responsibility of getting it done the way we need to get done according to our contract. You know, you can put anything into your contract. So as long as you're clear with the expectations on both sides and it's in a contract, then um, I think that's the important way to get started off on a good foot. Yeah. Now, if someone's listening and going, hmm, maybe I have some skills that I could put forth and become somebody's virtual assistant. What does that process look like? How would you How would you recommend somebody get started? I would say um, take a look at what you're good at and also what you enjoy doing. Because there's a lot of things I'm good at, but I don't I don't enjoy doing it enough to, I mean, to really get paid to do it for anyone else. You know, <laughs> so. I would say once you know kind of what you're good at or what you're interested in and what you're interested enough to invest in yourself. 
Mm-hmm. So if there's a skill that you would enjoy doing or you want to enjoy to learn how to do, you have to invest in yourself first before you expect any business owner to invest in you. If you, have, if you haven't invested in the time to set up your business correctly, require, you know, acquire the, the required training or skills or experience, whether you're doing it for yourself or if you do it, sometimes people start out, they ask a friend or somebody close to them, like, hey, can I do this in exchange for a testimonial or a review or for experience? So I would say if you're not willing to invest in yourself in order to be the best you can be, don't expect any, any business owner to spend their money, their hard-earned money to invest in you as well. Anybody who likes pets can say, okay, I'm a dog walker because I walk dogs. But do they really have a business? You know, the same way we can right. say that there's hobby pet care people and then there's pet care businesses. The same thing can be for a VA. I mean, to be a VA, you have to be really serious about what you're doing. Because remember, you are, you're now responsible for not only your own business success, but your client's business as well. And I take that responsibility very seriously. And I mean, I love what I do and I love seeing them grow and being able to help in any way I can, but I don't take it lightly. And I don't say, okay, well, I'm working for myself. So today I'm just going to sit on the couch and it doesn't matter that they need this. I know if I make a commitment and you know, you're saying that you're going to be there, you really need to be there for them, for them in the way that they, they hired you to be. <laughs> yeah, there, there's again that personal personal responsibility taking yourself seriously, so that other people will see that seriousness and know that you know it's important to you. It, you you recognize it as a business. How do you right. how do you balance the pet sitting and the VA work throughout the day? Oh my goodness! Well, it's COVID has actually been a blessing in this way because a lot of the pet business has slowed down enough for me to spend the time getting all my systems in place for my VA business. But I would say you just have to be really good at organizing and prioritizing and being honest. I'm not going to take on any project, whether it's pet sitting or whether it's a VA client, if I don't have the time realistically in my schedule to complete what needs to get done in the time that you know they need. So if that means I have to turn down a weekend client because I want to spend time with my kids and take them somewhere, well, then I just need to be honest and do that. Same thing with my VA business. If 50 people today called me and said, I need a logo by next week. Clearly, I'm not going to be able to do that. So, you know, they'd have to get in line. And that would be great. I would love if 50 people called me today (laughs) looking to hire me. But you know what I mean? It's really about just being realistic and being organized and getting your calendar down and saying, okay, I block my time. This is my time for this. and This is my time for this. And trying to stick with it. It's not always going to be exactly like that. There has to be some flexibility, but I'd say in general, that's, that's what has served me well. Yeah. Looking at your priorities going, what's my number one priority? And then because that's my number one priority, what must fall in line? What must I say no to if that's really my number one priority? As you said, if, if weekends to go with my kids somewhere is my number one priority, I must say no to bookings for that weekend so that I can do this. Because if you, if you start saying yes to things that don't align with your priority, was it even a priority to begin with? And no, and staying consistent with that is is really the hard part. Honestly, it goes back to what I said about having a great relationship with your clients. My pet sitting clients and my VA clients, they all know me and they know that I have a good work ethic and they know that I'm a person of integrity. So let's say because I am a solo sitter now that I get sick or something happens and I'm a little bit late for something or I have to, we have to adjust the deadline. We have such a great relationship because I only work with people that I can serve well and that we mesh well. It doesn't, it's not a problem. They have to change things. I have to change things. It's kind of the ebb and flow of owning a business. And if you have a great relationship and there's no animosity there, you just can, as long as you communicate, I think people are willing to be a lot more um, forgiving and give a lot more grace than we um, give people credit for. (laughs) I was just about to say, then we give people credit for, because we expect, you know, if we say no, people are going to come out the woodwork with their pitchforks and knives and chase us away because we <laughs> right. <already> know. <laughs> but really, uh, building those relationships and, and, and trusting one another. Again, as we started talking off at the very beginning of our, of our conversation here, of like the importance of building trust in these relationships. When somebody trusts you and you have a relationship with them, you can say no to them and they're still going to be there. They're still going to like you. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) And it goes both ways too. So, you know, as a VA, you know, things do come up and sometimes, you know, like an emergency might happen. I have to reschedule a meeting. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens the same way. I want grace and forgiveness and, you know, to realize that I'm human the same way I have to do it for my client. 
clients. My clients are, they owe me something, a deliverable and they're late and they have to change the date or something comes up in their personal life. I mean, we're all, again, we're all in this together. And I think that when you work with a great team of people who can support you and you can be there for them, there's nothing better to me. I know being a VA isn't for everybody, but it's, it's seriously what I love, love doing. Yeah. As you mentioned, it is that ebb and flow. It's a give and take on both sides that, that makes what that is. That, that's a working relationship when both people are giving and taking, you know, back and forth so that right. it, so that stuff happens so that you can <laughs> get work done. Right. And that's and that's what makes it uh, successful. I mean, there's a big difference between making excuses for not getting things done and needing some grace because, you know, life happens. Mm. And as long as, you know, you stay true to yourself and know that you're doing it for the right reasons and that you can't, there's some things that are just out of our control. The rest just kind of falls into place. Right. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. The making excuses versus understanding and needing that there's times for grace uh, and when, because things happen. It's, it's, we, you, you see that in your daily life. So, uh, and you have to recognize that other people see that too. Other people know right. things happen. And so it's not, and, and so th- you have to trust that. And that's just part of that, that, that relationship. I love that. That was, I like that so much. <laughs> I mean, heaven knows I needed my fair share and some more of grace in my life. So I try to give it out as um, more than I need to take it. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a, that's a wonderful <laughs> life lesson. Are you a member of Pet Sitters International? BSI is the largest educational association for professional pet sitters and dog walkers with a mission to promote pet sitting excellence through education. PSI is offering a free five-day New Year challenge for pet sitters and dog walkers, January 4th through the 8th. This is a free challenge and is open to both members and non-members this year. Visit PetSit.com slash challenge to sign up and access the private challenge Facebook group. This free challenge will offer daily videos, action items and resources to help new and veteran pet care professionals alike refocus and set their businesses up for success in 2021. Again, visit petsit.com forward slash challenge before December 31st to register for the challenge. Thinking of, of pet sitters, what would you say is your number one or maybe your biggest piece of advice for other pet sitters? I would say um, that on a regular basis, you need to go back to your why. Remember why you started your business. What is your goal? And most of your big business decisions are going to come back to, do they align with what, why I'm doing what I'm doing? And does this represent me well? I think if you can answer those two questions when you're making like the big, big decisions, everything else will kind of fall where they need to be. You're not always going to get it right, but if you know, if you have a solid foundation of who you are and who you want to be, and remember your business is kind of like a second you, it's, it's a person in its own self. It needs to be nurtured and respected and cared for. So if you can kind of apply what, what you want for you to your business, I kind of think that you'll be successful in the way that success is defined for you. And everybody doesn't have the same definition and that's a hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Not everybody wants to be a seven figure business. Not everybody wants to work seven days a week. It is okay to kind of carve your own path in this industry. Yeah. And, and reminding yourself of that, you know, you said revisit your why periodically, just like we send reminders to our clients to review the forms, review the policies and procedures. We need, right. that, we need that reminder in our life too. Do, whether it's an annual review, a quarterly review, something like that. To, to, to look and go, am I still doing, am I still doing this because, you know, I want to be doing it? Is this how I would be operating my business? And just you know, so you stay true to yourself in, in your business, because that's, you know, that helps avoid burnout, that hel- helps avoid so many other things when you're running the business that you want to be running. Right. You know what I tell people too? I also say that, you know, it's okay to change your mind. Mm. Like you might want to start out as a dog walking and cat care. And next year, if you decide to only be an in-home daycare, that is okay. Nothing, pretty much not much is written in concrete that can't be changed. Yeah. It is okay to grow and evolve. And that can mean you change your services or change your service area or update your pricing. Like a lot of people get into this mindset that they set this up and it has to be this way forever. And then they're miserable because they want to change something. And I kind of say, well, you know, we're not a tree. Like, let's just move. Like, let's just, 
<laughs> you're not planted in one area. You're not stuck with one thing. Like, let's make it happen. So I think that's a good reminder that if there's something you're unhappy with, sit back, remember your why and kind of say, well, I can, I can now repaint this the way I want it to be painted. That's going to make me happy. Right. I could not agree more. That's wonderful. Melanie, thank you so much for coming on today and talking about your story and getting started, staying organized, and then letting us peek behind the curtain of what it's like being a VA. So thank you again so much for coming on today. It's been a real pleasure. If people have questions, want to get in touch, follow along with all of the things that you have going on, how can they do that? (laughs) Well, I can be reached um, on my website, which is www.thevirtualpetpro.com. And I can be emailed at hello at thevirtualpetpro.com. Um, I am on Facebook and Instagram, although I will admit that a lot of times it's kind of like the cobbler's kids who have no shoes. I am so busy sometimes getting the social media done for all of my clients and all the things that sometimes mine gets put on the back burner, but that's okay for me. But just know that I am here for anyone who wants to reach out. If you have a special project that you'd like to do or some way that you think you might need help, I'd love to hop on a quick discovery call and have a quick chat about how I may be able to help them. And the thing is, is if I can't, I know a lot of resources. I might be able to put them in touch with somebody who can fit them as they best need fit. I just want to say thank you for having me on. It's been such a pleasure to get to share my story um, with your audience and just get to chat with you today. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Likewise, it's been a real pleasure. Melanie, thank you so much. Thanks, Colin. My two biggest takeaways from my conversation were Melanie were one, you are enough for your business. And that's exactly what sets you apart from anybody else doing anything that is remotely close to the kind of services that you offer. I cannot tell you how much I love that and how uplifting that is. But again, how scary that also is to realize that we, we are the ones that are enough and we have to be okay with that. And, and that is a process. Absolutely. And then two, I really appreciated how Melanie explained how she views herself as being part of the community and how she takes that so seriously in everything she does from being in somebody's home to when she's out and walking around, she is representing not just her business, but she's representing herself in the community for others to see and for others to connect with, to know more about her and to trust her and the services that she provides. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Time to Pet and Pet Sitters International for making this week's show possible. We'd love to hear feedback and get in contact with you. So check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Pet Sitter Confessional and email us at feedback at PetSitterConfessional.com. Head on over to our website, PetSitterConfessional.com and uh, see a lot of the resources, a lot of our previous episodes as well with full transcripts that you can read through and you can click on all the resources that we talk about there as well. Megan and I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays this year, and we wish you all the best. We'll be back again soon.